In this second part of the lecture, I want to turn to this little article that I assigned to you from Rasmussen and Domke, very recent article, and in which they take a sort of an opposite approach than the standard scientific framework that we've been discussing up until now. In that standard approach, we begin with the disorder or the therapy and work outwards from there in terms of identifying potential um, potential biomarkers and potential, and potential treatment options. These guys are asking, well, what about when the SNPs tell us nothing? Well, what's nothing? I mean, but the, uh, the point that I want to get across when I say nothing is that many of these studies, and you have, we've, just, we've encountered this already, uh, and you'll encounter it in your own researches as well, is that there's conflicting data, there's unconnected data, there's unconnected data and there's unconnectable data just because of by virtue of the fact that the study design might be so incredibly different in any case oftentimes however there are SNPs that might be fairly common SNPs that still t tell us very little about the biology of the disorder or about the treatment of that disorder so these guys are coming at it from the outside and saying well what if we look at at structural variation that is structural variation within uh, the genomic context and work inwards to find what those structural variations might tell us about oh, um, implementation of pharmacogenetic testing and individualized drug treatments. And there I'm just reading from their, from their abstract, which I encourage you to go do as well. These guys define structural variations as a change of greater than a kilobase. And that change, again, we're not talking about SMPs anymore. We're talking about changes in position inversion, duplication, deletion, and or copy number. And all of these together can, of course, relate to the biology of a disease. We can learn something about bi the biology, but we can also think about drug targets as well. So this might be a sort of a more big data and let's say more broadly systematic approach to understanding how variation relates to relates to pharmaco uh, pharmacobiology. Okay, so what do they find? Well, in the genome, they find, and this is mostly data mining uh, uh, story, which is always fun. Uh, some fifty-eight thousand structural variants in the human genome. They start. So these are their. This is their database. Databases. They see that the FDA has some 876 approved drugs that make their cut for analysis. Um, of these 630, of, so of these 876 drugs, some 613 have variant targets that they're acting upon. 25 of those target drug metabolizing enzymes. So again, you kind of see the, the, the in, ter in terms of the comparison of these numbers, you see a little bit of that imbalance between. Uh, how how often we might target a drug metabolizing enzyme um, versus how often we might think about the variation affecting the drug the drug receptor molecule. Yeah, so you can see the breakdown here. Most of these involve copy number variations, and we've encountered copy number variation before in terms of the EGFR receptor and potentially having an, an effect on the actual expression levels of of that of that particular particular receptor. Some 30% of, of uh, drug targets have no structural variation and others have some copy number variation or, or uh, and, and as, as well as an inversion. So but in any case we see that the bulk of these uh, involve copy number variations. Now there's other ways to sort of present their findings. Um, Let's see. So they, the total number of variants that they identify is some 1,700 variants that affect some 495 genes that are that encode drug targets. The point being, of course, that this that this kind of discovery of structural variation might in the future be able to point us towards identifying um, targets for therapy and identify and identify uh, potential um, potential targets for pharmacogenetic testing all right so anyway just as, maybe almost as an aside for 
the, I, how one approaches uh, biomarker development. But still, a very interesting aside. Now, what is overall, however, let's get back to the idea and you know part of the impetus for that for the previous the study that I just showed you is what appears to be a slow pace of development of of biomarkers that have a clinical utility and there it's obvious but let's but it's it's use and so our target of course is clinical utility but we can break these down into a few different into a few different strata right basically telling us about and of course we're always going to come back to these these as basic questions is What's the performance of the biomarker, right? So here again is that idea of the validity. There's a scientific framework, but then there's also the the utility of that, and that. But that the, the, that is also inextricably bound up with well, why separate practicality and cost effectiveness? Those are very closely related, but those are also important drivers of whether a particular biomarker is going to find its way into clinical use. Um, but the but in terms of this figure again stolen from Zena. Uh, we have patient-related uh, issues in terms of of what's driving uh, the pace of biomarker development. We have research-driven issues, and we have health system-related issues. And let's say that um, uh, the the well, let's just say, and I'll, here's an assertion. Let's just call it an assertion that the practicality issues is going to devolve on the health system and what kinds of facilities are in place how it's getting paid for who's doing the work and how are they how are they getting put into those positions those are driving the costs and of course we are all well aware that the costs are what's driving the availability of many of much treatment uh, at least in our in our cultural context now in terms of the patients well this is an interesting term, health values. Uh, I, I guess all I'll say about health values, uh, all I'll say about patient-related concerns is that the patients want to have valuable information about their disease. And But in terms of what the patients need, there's a, there are questions about how much of the disease complexity are they going to understand. And, and I think it's fair to say that a patient's understanding of the disorder that they're suffering from has a lot to do with their oftentimes, especially now in the age of, of Googling your disease, has a lot to do with what the patients might expect. So let's also, let's call some of this expectations. All right, now that's all very different from the research context. Um, and this, maybe it's worth breaking this apart into a few different uh, research contexts. There's the there's the drug company, you know, and then let's always realize that there's not always a clear separation between these and the and the health system. There's the uh, there's the drug company. There's the there's the academic researcher. Who's got funding concerns? I won't go on too much longer about this, but it's interesting just to think about all the issues that are slowing things down or accelerating things. And um, there's regulatory uh, component to this, to all of this research. And of course, these don't get separated very easily. And there's also doctors, right? But the and uh, again, these ca these categories don't necessarily segregate very clearly, but they're all different stakeholders in the development of new biomarkers. All right. Now, there's aside from patients wanting to clearly understand and doctors wanting to clearly understand what their patients are going through. It's there is a clear benefit to utilization of biomarkers. Oops, excuse me. There is a clear utility in the use of biomarkers to drive t a tailoring of a, of a of a clinical trial. So, oh. 
repetitious. Okay, so that's really obvious. And but, but but back up and say, well, what do we mean by targeting? Well, in the case of Herceptin, so if we skip if we skip to the punchline here, if we target if we tailor our study population, so let's put make it clear. What are we targeting here? We're, study, we're targeting the study population. Who do we include in our trial, and who do we exclude, and how we an, how do we analyze that? Well, if we look at the, uh, the development of Herceptin and the efficacy of Herceptin, we're looking at receptor uh, expression as a driver of who we include or exclude from the study. And if we look at two different studies of Herceptin, we see that the untargeted study had some 50-fold greater patients required to establish in a, in, establish similar uh, outcomes as the targeted to the targeted trial. So that's an enormous number of patients, uh, and that's I mean just from the human perspective, that's an, that's a a lot smaller number of patients potentially suffering the deleterious effects of that of uh, that come along with any trial. Um, from an economical perspective, that of course is saving the drug companies and everyone else, uh, and eventually the consumer, um, a vast amount of money in terms of the all stages of the of the drug development. So now let's turn to the article that I gave you to read. Um, why I like this article is that it represents a mathematical model. that's trying to find a way to express or, or quantify the benefit that might be derived from stratifying one's clinical trial. Without belaboring their study too much, they're looking here at the ratio of numbers of patients in untargeted versus targeted trial designs as a function of the number of patients responding. So let's think about this as this patients, patients responding. Whether or not they have a, a you know, whether or not they have that positive bar biomarker uh, signature. In any case, the, let, let's simplify just by saying that here we have, let's pay attention to these data first of all. Um, the point being that the, uh, for a particular proportion of response, responders in the study, the ratio get will get the ratio will be greater uh, that is to say higher number of patients required in the untargeted study now that's something that we all is intuitively obvious but these guys have found a way to, to try to quantify that and as as the proportion of responders gets larger and larger and larger and we work our way down to a point where everybody in this study responds and let's just call this blockbuster drug that we know doesn't really exist then the trial design is no different. The number of patients required is no different. But as that number of responders gets smaller and smaller, and let's refer back to uh, therapies in which a relatively small number of patients might respond for any particular reason, let me point out that in this study, they don't that what the marker is that it, that the patient might be stratified according to doesn't matter but the point is that as the number of responders get smaller and smaller the benefits that accrue from targeting your trial design get larger and larger and larger the only other thing the detail to point out here is that there's another data set here and the difference that we're pointing that we're pointing out is that you can scale in terms of your cost benefit ratio for trial design you can scale uh, according to whether uh, the non-responders have absolutely no response or actually whether they have some partial response. And of course, this is probably going to be more uh, likely to be the case. And you, But of course, there's, there's going to be a scale effect that, uh, that changes this ratio. But in either case, we see that even in, a, in the case of a partial effect, again, as that number of responders gets smaller and smaller, the benefits that accrue from stratifying the design get larger and larger. So again, Nothing new there, nothing that's counterintuitive, I think, but it's always nice to see that there's a mechanism for quantifying um, that, that particular effect. Okay, now, what else can we talk about here? Uh, okay, so getting on to thinking about clinical trial design. In this case, 
in this particular little slide, all I want to point out is to highlight the various utilities of biomarkers in different stages of drug trials. So um, in a preclinical trial, and, I, and I'm not going to I'm not going to refer explicitly back to, but I'll point you back to that first slide when I talked about what the FDA would be looking for in different kinds of in different kinds of trial and different kinds of um, application. Uh, at, at the early stages, bah, at the early stages, preclinical stages, we're looking at the validation. Right, there's that term again, the validation of the biomarker. So we're establishing the scientific framework, if you will, for utilization of a biomarker uh, that will become important as the trial goes along. Later in early phase clinical trials, and here, you know, this is going to tell, remind you about what a phase one trial might look like. DLT is just reverse referring to the dose limiting toxicity. And again, forgive me if those terms are familiar to all of us. They're not familiar to everyone, uh, so it's and it's always worth reviewing. Um, and then MTD referring to the maximum um, tolerated dose. Okay, so obviously we're worrying about toxicity in these phase one trials, perhaps more than we're worrying about efficacy. Um, but even so, the biomarker is going to be used to to look at a correlation between uh, the presence of the presence or absence and of the biomarker signal and the response. Oh, and again, what we're talking about doing ultimately here is finding a mechanism for stratifying the population according to a biomarker. So if we can find a bio biomarker that teaches us something about how the patient's going to respond to our therapy, then we are enriching our study. This is a term that you'll encounter frequently, enriching. We're enriching the shareholders by saving the money in clinical trials, uh, <laughs> but we're also enriching the study for uh, patients that, that it makes sense to treat with this particular therapy. Later on, phase two, phase three trials, we're not going to go into great detail about the differences of, of those, but what we're looking for is, again, that validation so that we can include that biomarker in our labeling. So what we're, of course, we want, ultimately the, the goal here is a clinical utility that's going to allow the doctor uh, means of of determining whether or not a patient is a is a candidate for a particular drug. Now, again, uh, there's the distinction that that is worth keeping in mind that will be um, disease ID, disease identification, versus uh, versus and and prognosis. Let's see, they so call it prognosis and therapy. And of course, those distinctions, again, I said it before, those distinctions break down frequently, but let's, let's just keep those in mind as potential, uh, potentially important uh, distinctions to be made. So along those lines, let's look at these couple of figures from Kelloff about stratification of trials um, by, by biomarkers. Uh, in a phase two trial, of course, we're talking about establishing safety and efficacy of the drug, but we're not specifically we're not specifically um, um, evaluating the marker itself. We're evaluating the drug. Now, the point, however, in this slide is that we can make a choice in this early days of uh, of drug development to decide whether or not to use the biomarker as a means of stratifying the population. Um, so we could exclude biomarker negative patients from the study group and thereby, and this would be the same thing as saying enriching, and we've already talked about the benefits of that in terms of shrinking the size of the population, but by doing, by doing uh, incl by including, though, uh, both biomarker positive and negative patients in the design, uh, we can evaluate the efficacy range of, of the drug 
uh, both in so we can say well what what is the overall range in the population that responds to the drug so both of those both of those are important pieces of information um, and so I think you can uh, but and but and both of and whether or not to include those of course uh, uh, whether or not to to stratify or not depends in large part back to this idea of the validity of the biomarker and how robust is the biomarker itself as a predictor of behavior and how how robust is the response to the drug but again we're trying to establish both of those things in these early trials now here's another example from the Kelloff review of cancer biomarkers that I gave you to read in this case we're talking about phase three studies and we're talking about analysis now the key here is that the stratification is only taking place after the trial after the the population of the trial um, into different into different arms depending what control uh, um, study or different drug treatment regimes so let's call this just let's call these treatment regimes so the biomarker is is only used to analyze these results so that's that's the point here all patients are screened but the data is not used to stratify now why would you do that well again we already talked about how uh, we can use that information after the fact after the treatment to x to express the tr to the, express the efficacy range so I'll just write that again efficacy range so we'll make sense of the results uh, in terms of so we'll read the we'll read the primary endpoint uh, in this and for cancer it's so often it's progression free survival um, we'll read that result in terms of biomarker status so this is not a streamlined study right we haven't limited the number of patients that we use and we're not using that information about their biomarker status to determine where they go in the study but it gives a wider range of interpretable results um, and uh, and allows us to establish different therapeutic regimes as as being um, as being uh, useful or not. So, um, and as an example, in this particular study, now I'm not talking about the details of this study, but the paper that I gave you to read does. This happens to be a study in which we're looking at treatment for non-small cell lung cancer, um, different populations. But the point is that. For the gefedinib arm here, remember gefedinib is another receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor. 24% um, um, of the enriched arm, uh, that is to say, biomarker positive arm, is, uh, has improved, improves, or shows uh, good results in terms of the primary endpoint. Versus in the total population, 6%. Um, um, uh, so total population but whether biomarker positive or negative so you can see um, very clearly when you do the full study and you only utilize the the um, the biomarker as a means of understanding the endpoints how drastically improved uh, the patient population is when we when we if we did stratify so that's useful information to have uh, as the as the cl clinical trial proceeds it also speaks to the utility and validity of the biomarker itself uh, uh, quite apart from um, quite apart from the from the the drug application <laughs>